Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Our Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm Rachel. I'm calling in from Boston. It's afternoon for me here, but uh, morning for our friends on the call. If you just joined now, feel free to introduce yourselves through the chat window and say hello, maybe where you're calling in from. But just to go through a brief agenda, we'll have some short introductions of the meetup and code of conduct. Um, but Uli and uh, Nick will share a behind the scenes look at their road trip app, which I got a first glimpse of last holiday season and was super impressed from it and wanted to see how it how it worked behind the scenes. Um, we'll also have lots of time for questions after the presentation as well. Um, but with that, I am so excited to turn it over to, I think, Uli, you're starting first, <laughs> to Uli right. first and then Nick. Yeah. Hey, um, Rachel, um, uh, yeah, thanks for the in intro and uh, really excited to actually um, chip in with that meetup and to get to know you all. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining. And um, title for today's session is Under the Hood of the Aotearoa Road Trip. And I provide a bit of an intro who we are and how uh, we came to uh, creating uh, the app we demo today. Um, so we are, um, we are App Interactive and we are based in New Zealand or uh, the uh, Maori name or the, uh, yeah, so the original name of New Zealand is Aotearoa. And um, so we are a company here in, in Wellington, in the capital of New Zealand, and we um, yeah, work a lot with R and also R Shiny. And uh, so what we are known for, so we uh, create more complex or sophisticated apps to which often connect research and science with uh, decision making. So um, as you do the last couple of uh, years, we, for, for example, we are part of the uh, New Zealand uh, COVID-19 response. So we created a lot of dashboards to help uh, response services and also created a dashboard for the general public. Or another example you see here is, uh, so we uh, work together with the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. So, and uh, to um, help decision making around the spread of aquatic uh, invasive species in Minnesota, because they are known for their uh, 10,000 lakes. So there are two examples of the apps we produce. And, um, yeah, we are, we are a small team here, so we uh, got uh, got some photos here. So uh, Petra and I, so we are directors, and we um, yeah, um, so we founded IP Interactive, and we have a, a software development team. So and our developer team, so currently five uh, five staff, and Nick is one of them. Uh, I saw also Shana joining, so she heads our uh, design uh, UI and UX team. And uh, we also have yeah, Chris with, uh, who looks after the admin. Um, so depending which map you use, so we are actually in the center of the world. So you see that in the middle and uh, meaning we are reasonably close to a lot of other locations, so, but the closest we are probably to um, Australian. So, uh, but unfortunately, when you look at some other maps, so we often drop off into the into the right corner there, so which is <laughs> so a small country in the Pacific. But um, yeah, so uh, I'm not too sure uh, who who um, kind of looked a bit closer into New Zealand. That maybe some of you guys have already tra traveled there. It's actually a really beautiful country. So we've got it's divided in two islands. So we've got the North Island and we've got the South Island. Um, the top there are some pictures of the of the South Island. So we've got the Southern Alps and uh, great skiing there and a really beautiful land landscape. We've got nice beaches. So I think in the middle is is Golden Bay, close to to Nelson. And um, yeah, on some days you can go skiing in the morning and go for a surf in the in the afternoon. So great country to live in. So I'm originally from Disclosure. Um, disclosure, I'm originally from Germany, but I moved to New Zealand around 17 years ago. And uh, yeah, it's home, home right now. Um, yeah, so we are um, in based in the capital of New Zealand, so close to 
um, so on the so what you see in the bottom picture so that's the Miramar Peninsula so that's where also Veta um, film studios are located and so they created for for example Lord of the Rings uh, who New Zealand is uh, I believe quite famous for so um, it's um, can be also it can be really nice on a on a on a calm day but often it's really really windy and when they google uh, on YouTube so the um, landings when it's really so when you fly into Wellington <laughs> so it's quite a famous and there are some really scary videos out there to to, to fly into Wellington. <clears throat> All right um, let's dive into the Christmas tool so and so we, we'd like to um, present you a little bit the uh, latest edition of it and uh, basically it's it became a little bit of a tra tradition. So we end of the year, we work on a, get the, the team to work on a, on a fun project. So we, there can be pretty much anything. So uh, there can be a short, short video clip. There can be just some fun charts, uh, browser games, um, or like with it uh, for, for last year, shiny applications. And um, so we have, if you want to have a bit of a browse, if you want to access the um, <clears throat> the Aotearoa road trip um, app, uh, so we've got, got the link in the presentation. And Rachel, I think we can share uh, the presentation with, uh, uh, with the people who, who are joining today. And um, also maybe a disclosure, we also planning to put uh, the code of the app on our uh, GitHub uh, repo. So we're just about uh, stitching that together because we also want to explain it a little bit so that uh, that's gonna come for um, soonish. Not 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 uh, ready right now, but it will be, uh, give, give us some time with it. Um, all right, um, so the, you should see that. So um, latest one is the road trip, but there are also other uh, sort of fun, um, fun apps there. So I'd like to show you the app. Um, so show you a little bit around. And um, so it's it's a simple app. Uh, but what we'd like to demo today is in particular the uh, JavaScript integration and uh, Nick will um, dive into it and Oshiny provides uh, actually a really cool framework to to integrate that and to work on those um, yeah finer let's say finer things in uh, we used in the app which make it I think really really fun to look at and to use um, so it's relatively simple so we um, yeah we always brainstorm a little bit what we um, what we're gonna do um, with, with the app and uh, sort of how we came to it is we uh, we kind of used a big whiteboard and then we decided on locations to go on a road trip and of course last year New Zealand was uh, still still closed and uh, so we we had to confine the road trip basically to, to New Zealand and we selected a couple of um, really iconic locations and um, so and you can actually go on the trip so let's start that one and uh, so we, we start basically from the south of New Zealand and then work our way up uh, north. So we, we start with uh, um, Otago Pen Peninsula. So we, um, it's um, yeah, very known for the yellow-eyed penguins. And then uh, so how the app is built up, we show postcards. And then we have uh, yeah, a car on the location which then moves along. So we um, programmed in a way so you can click to the next stop and you move uh, to the different location and get a short explanation to, uh, of the location there. So let's maybe just um, uh, click through it. So start with Otago Peninsula and then uh, move up to Wanaka. So that's uh, yeah, really beautiful. A landscape there. Uh, it's in the su Southern Alps, and then uh, we um, yeah carry on. What you see already there. So we um, the car moves, and then we also um, move the map 
uh, alongside. So uh, Nick will explain a little bit how we how we did that, and there are also really subtle things in it. So for for instance, the the direction of the car um, is moving, and um, and you see the the car wobbling a little bit. So that's kind of a fun fun little thing, which um, makes it. Make, makes it nicer to interact with. We, we also have that moving background here. Um, so move our way up. So go over to, to Christchurch. And uh, for those of you now, so Christchurch was in a big earthquake in uh, 2011. And uh, so they uh, rebuilt the city. And uh, so quite famous is that uh, cardboard uh, cathedral. So you can move further up to Kaikoura. Kaikoura really famous for dolphin watching and whale watching. Um, and then uh, go to uh, Wellington um, on the North Island, so southern tip of the North Island. So that's where we've got our office set up. It's the capital of New Zealand and uh, government uh, is located there as well. Um, and then uh, next one up is Oakune, so it's a bit of a ski town, uh, the kind of base of Mount Ruapeo, and it's really famous for, for carrots, so because they grow a lot of carrots there. And uh, next stop is uh, Taranaki and New Plymouth, so it's my favorite spot probably to, to go, go for a surf in, in New Zealand, just been there last, last week actually, it's a really great location move up. And then uh, famous Hoppington from uh, Lord of the Rings. I think that was Nick's uh, favorite location to, to, to add to the app. And uh, then last one um, up in Auckland. And uh, so we, and that uh, ends, ends the journey basically. Um, cool. So let me go back. So these are the, the ones, yeah, so a bit of background to it. And um, these are the postcards um, with um, design. So uh, when you look at the app, you will also see um, the app is uh, fully mobile responsive because um, um, we also, of course, when you, when you send out the link and people look at it, so a lot of people these days look, uh, um, uh, check out the, the app on their phones. So uh, there was also a requirement to have that working. So we stacked that and uh, so we did, uh, we in parallel, we created the, the app um, yeah, for, for larger screens, but also for mo mobile devices in there. So when you look at the code, uh, you will also see kind of how, how that's done. Um, cool. I think Nick, um, we can probably dive a little bit under the hood of it. Um, I uh, stop my sharing and uh, yeah, hand over to you. And um, yeah, looking forward to see <laughs> how it's done, <laughs> Nick. All right, thanks for that, Uli. Um, hopefully the microphone's coming through, the screen share's coming through, everything working okay? Thumbs That's up, great. That's perfect. Great. All right, so we'll go now and get a little bit uh, under the hood, get into the weeds of the application itself and how that's built up. Um, so this will be a little bit swapping between the presentation that we have here, kind of a general overview, and then going into our studio and looking into the code itself. Uh, so starting off kind of some high level details under the hood. So we built up this application, application using our version uh, 4.0.5. Um, so at the time, I think 4.1.2 had just come out. Uh, around the time when we started putting this together, if I remember right, but we decided to stick with that version um, because you know it was it was stable and we were familiar with it, and so we just kind of used that as our jumping off point. Uh, so we also used Shiny 1.6.0 for this one. Um, just generally, we try to keep uh, reasonably up to date with the versions of the packages that we're using, and with Shiny that being kind of like the the backbone of the application, so we try to keep that. Yeah, relatively up to date. Um, with the hosting, so we have that running on an AWS instance and we have uh, several applications running on that server. So that's our rshiny.epinteractive.com server that we use to kind of demo different applications because it's relatively lightweight. Um, we don't need to worry about giving it like its own separate instance or anything like that. So we can kind of bundle it up there with, with our other um, applications that we 
um, can kind of keep on there to, to put them out there and test them and, do, and run them so that everyone can access. Uh, so we have running on that server, we're using the open source Shiny server. So that's what you know, allows us to run the application and hook that up so that you can access it from the browser. And then with the packages that we're using, it's a relatively uh, confined list there. So we're using uh, dplyr to kind of help with a little bit of the filtering uh, from our location data. Uh, we're using HTML tools and HTML widgets to help to handle the, uh, the leaflet JavaScript plugin, which we'll get into a bit later. Uh, obviously we use leaflet to build up kind of the, the map that we use as the foundation of our, our road trip. Then we use Shiny to build up the application structure itself. Uh, we use Shiny Router to handle multiple pages in the application because we have our splash page and we have the actual map page. And then we use Shiny JS to help us link in uh, the, the events and the functionality from our Shiny application. And so linking that up to JavaScript functionality as well. Uh, so kind of the key ideas behind uh, the code base that we're gonna talk about today are to do with uh, modularization of the code base. Uh, so that's you know, splitting out our file structure, but also using uh, modules from Shiny to separate responsibilities a little bit. Uh, the leaflet plugins and JavaScript and how we did that for the map is kind of a big part of it. Um, and so that's a little bit extending leaflet beyond the basic functionality of leaflet for R. Uh, we also uh, use reactivity so we can, so we kind of stage our reactives and then that helps us deal with our UI um, quite easily. And then the last thing which we'll look at is a little bit of uh, user experience. So the little changes that we can make along the way to add up to you know, noticeable improvements for the user. Starting off then with the uh, modularization and the file structure uh, of the application. So as a general rule, whenever we uh, do a, a Shiny application, we try to follow this UI server and global pattern um, as opposed to uh, uh, you can also put it into kind of one file and just use like an app.r and put all of your UI, all of your server into this one file. We like to split it out into these three separate files so that you know, there's a really clear separation of responsibilities. And you know, for some apps, as they get larger, um, having it split out into those separate files then makes it easier for us to come back later on and um, you know, debug where things might be going wrong. Uh, important distinction is that we also try to keep the UI and the server quite minimal. Um, so you'll see when we jump over to the code base in a moment that there's really not that much happening in these top level files. They're kind of setting up the, the basic, like the core functionality, the core structure of the application, but we generally prefer to push out most of the, the work that's happening in these applications to the, uh, to the different page modules that we're using or different sub modules. Um, so trying to keep those as minimal as possible. <clears throat> So we use uh, Shiny Router, as I mentioned, to handle uh, multiple pages, and that allows us to have you know, meaningful URLs um, so that when you're on the splash page, you, know, you have your home link. And then when you're on the map page, you have another link. So if you wanted to send, if you wanted to get someone to go to a specific page, you can just send them that URL and you know they're gonna end up in the right place. Um, it's quite a, quite a popular package for us to use uh, in our applications. Uh, from that, we also use these page level modules. So in our little, diagram here. So we have our, our splash page and our map page, and we have those kind of set up as these page level modules, um, which we then split out into UI and server files, again, just so that we can separate those um, responsibilities uh, for those different components. What we also like to do is to have uh, kind of nested UI outputs, um, which we'll see when we jump into the code in a moment. But overall, um, the kind of the main idea with this is that we want to try and keep it simple. Um, you know, there's there's more complicated ways that we could set up kind of the the overall like modularization and the structure of the application. But you know, uh, we want to kind of keep it simple because that's going to make it easier for us to come back to it later as well. So if I bring up the if I bring up my R Studio window, is that coming through okay? It's good. Good. Awesome. Okay, so starting off first with the UI and server and global. So you can see what I mean here and that there's not really a lot going on in this UI.R here. So we're setting up the page, we're loading different resources that we might need, and then we're setting up the router. And essentially that's it, that, that's all we're doing in the UI. Um, so we're pushing most of that work out to these page modules, which we'll look at soon. 
a similar story in the server, all we're doing in here is actually calling the modules for the different pages. So we're calling for our splash page and our map page. We have this event here to set up so that when we change pages, um, you know, we scroll up to the top uh, and then we set up the kind of the functionality of the router. Just a quick um, question. Someone asked if you could zoom in a little bit. Absolutely. Zoom in. How's that? It's better. Looks okay. Good. Thanks. Perfect. And then in global here, so this is just where we're setting up um, the libraries that we're using. We are sourcing the different uh, R files that we need. Um, we have some stuff in here for the plugin, which we'll talk about a bit later. But otherwise, we're just setting up kind of our global variables in here so that we can then access them throughout the application elsewhere. So you can see we've got like our header set up here. This is where we set up the routes for our uh, Shiny router so that we can then create it in the UI and the server here. And so with the with the UI, so with the nested UI output, so we have the router being created there. And then I'll use the splash page as an example. Um, so what we said about having like nested UI outputs. So even in the splash page UI, um, this is still you know, relatively minimal um, compared to what we actually see on the app. So we just have, you know, we're setting up the structure of it. Um, and then we have this UI output for the page here. And so we actually create that over here in the splash page server. And this is quite a common thing that we like to do is to throw the UI parts of the application. So pushing that responsibility over to the server. So this is where we're actually creating the bulk of the UI for that page is here in the server in this render UI block. And so we do that so that um, as we'll see in a little bit later on, we can take advantage of uh, reactivity um, and using reactives to kind of help build our UI uh, and update you know, without us having to do too much. So I guess moving on to the next point, uh, the next part of the application, the most interesting part, I think, uh, which would be the leaflet. So setting up our um, the map, which you know, we'll be using for the road trip. Uh, and so we set up the map using relatively standard uh, leaflet for R, um, which we'll have a look at shortly. But then we do uh, a few other things to kind of get it to the point where it is in the application. So one thing you may notice uh, if you you know, tinkering around with the application is that you can't manually move the map so you can't click and drag on the map um, and that's because we have this we have that disabled so that the movement is just linked up uh, to to you pressing you know the go forward and go back buttons um, so that you don't get lost anywhere on the map uh, and then with uh, so with the movement on the map so for the car which we'll look at shortly so that's kind of a combination of things which are going together to do that um, so we're using uh, a leaflet JavaScript plugin, which we sourced from GitHub. Um, and we're also using uh, observe event and several utility functions. And we're using shiny JS to kind of link those two together. So I'll just jump back over to the code base here and how we actually set up the map. So that's happening obviously in map page server here. And so if I can find my map, so we have this render leaflet here. And so we have this uh, location data. So this is a reactive which we have set up, um, which holds you know, all the detail about the different locations and the coordinates and things like that. And we start off with our first position. So we're isolating that because we only want this to change when you move. Um, and so the first time, you know, the first time we're creating this, we want to use those first coordinates. So the current location data is for the first location there. And then we're setting up the uh, we're setting up a JavaScript command here, which we'll use, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit, which is how we actually create the car on the map. So we're setting that up here, but then actually creating the map. So we just call to leaflet and we set some options here. So minimum zoom, maximum zoom. Uh, and then we also disable uh, dragging there so that you can't you know, manually move the camera on the map as it were. Uh, we set the view. So we're setting that as our current position, which is the first location in our location data. So we're setting that view here, and we're just adding uh, default tiles. Uh, you know, there is the option to kind of customize what tiles we're using, but we figured for this one, because we're not zooming in that far anyway, um, the default tile set would do quite nicely, actually. And then we have the register plugin, which we'll talk about soon. 
but we also set up the markers. So the, um, yeah, the, the X's at the different locations on the map. So we are setting that up from our location data uh, and we're setting a, an, an offset as well. And that'll come in a little bit later so that the, um, so that the car doesn't appear underneath those markers. And then we're adding the lines in between all the markers. So we're doing that there. So we're just going through the different uh, uh, coordinates in, in our location data and making some dashed lines between them, which is what we end up seeing uh, in the application. So, so it's how you get the, uh, the map itself. You can't drag uh, the lines between them, the markers at the different locations. That's all being created in that command there. So the, the interesting part, I guess, or the more interesting part about this application specifically is how we hooked it up to um, yeah, these leaflet JavaScript plugins, um, because there are limitations to what um, you know, leaflet for R can do you know, out of the box. So when we're putting this together, we were looking around for ways that we could extend that. And we found a way that we can use these JavaScript plugins. Um, we can add those onto our leaflet for R maps so that we can actually access that functionality. So for this one specifically, we use the uh, moving marker uh, plugin, which is available on GitHub here. Um, I'll pop that in the chat as well. So that's um, the plugin that we're using for that, that moving marker. And so that's built for leaflet JavaScript. And so we need to register that on our um, leaflet for R map so that we can then use it um, in our application. And so we're doing that, uh, we're creating kind of a, a dependency in global.r and then we have a function there so that we can uh, register that plugin to our map. And so when we're actually creating the map the first time is where we bind the plugin to the map. And then we do kind of an extra step in the on render of when we're creating that map to help set up the, the marker for the first time. So actually setting up the car. So back into the code we go. And so starting off with actually registering the plugin. So we have up here, so we have this little utility function that we created called register plugin, which takes the arguments for a map and the plugin that we want to register. And it's just adding it to the dependencies of the map and then returning the map. Um, so the reason that we have that set up like so is so that we can hook it into uh, over here. So we can, pipe, we can put that into that kind of pipe. So as we're creating the map, we can then pass the map into this register plugin function here alongside the plugin that we've created, which we also do over here in global. So we have this object, this uh, moving marker plugin, which is an HTML dependency. And so we're just sourcing the uh, JavaScript. So we have that, we kind of downloaded a copy of the, um, of the moving marker plugin, and we just put that into our resources down here. So in our JavaScript folder. So we have a copy of that um, plugin sitting here. And so we're creating this HTML dependency, which is just going to source that, um, that code from our, from our um, file system here and then allow us to attach it to the map. So that's uh, where over here. So when we actually call register plugin, and so we're passing in that um, global uh, HTML dependency object, uh, and so that will then attach it to the map so that when we access the map later on, we can have access to all the functionality that we need. Um, that also comes into this uh, extra step that we have down here. So there's on render. So we're saying that when the, uh, when, when, when the map draws the first time, um, so we want to set up, uh, we want to run this, this function here. And so we're basically, we're creating uh, an object in JavaScript um, which is the map that we've just finished making. And so, so that we can then access that later on from our other JavaScript code, which we're going to use. And then after that, we're also running this JS string um, as a part of that function, which if you remember up here is this, um, it's a call to a JavaScript function, which, which we had set up earlier using you know, our initial position and our speed and things like that. So in this on render, so we're creating, like we're making a reference to the map so we can access it later. And then we're also um, running this, this uh, JavaScript function to actually set up the marker um, for the first time so that we can use it. 
which then leads into the next point, which is you're creating and moving the marker. So there's kind of two stages to this, and there's a, there's a JavaScript function, which we're going to keep coming back to um, for a lot of this stuff, um, which is that update car position. Um, so the two stages here, which are initialization, so when we're making it the first time around, and then uh, movement, which is, you know, it's already, it's already been created, it exists on the map, and we just want to move to the next place. So for the initialization, so we create an icon and we assign it to a new moving marker, and we uh, set up kind of the, the start and the end behavior for that marker. So when it starts moving and when it stops moving, what should it do? Uh, and then we put it onto our map in that initial position. Um, whereas for the movement, so if the marker is already there and it's already set up, then um, we update the direction. So we're using uh, GIFs to handle the direction of the car. So we update that uh, image if we need to. Uh, and then we move the marker to the new position and we also move the map to the new position. And how that looks in the code, so we have our main.js file here. And then we have these kind of two stages of it. So we have this if init, which is coming in from here. So this is our kind of initial setup phase here. And so in this stage, we're creating an icon and we're using, uh, to start off, we use the car facing left GIF and we give it a size and we put the anchor in the middle of that so that it appears in the right place. Uh, and then we create a uh, moving marker um, using the coordinates which are passed in to this function. We set the icon for this marker to the icon that we created here. Uh, we give it, we give the, the moving marker a much higher offset than if you remember, we set the offset for the, the locations, uh, we set that to zero. And so we set this to 1000, um, probably doesn't need to be that high, but the point is to set it higher so that when the car is on the map, it always appears in front of the location markers. Um, and then as a last thing that we do for setting that up, we set interactive equal to false so that you can't you know, click and interact with the car on the map. Then we set up the uh, kind of the start and end behavior. So as I said, that's when the car starts moving or when it stops moving. And so we link that up to uh, do some things with our controls. So you may notice in the application when the car starts moving, um, when it starts moving, these controls get disabled. And then when it stops moving, they get re-enabled. So we set that up in these on start and on end points here. And so we'll go into that a little bit later in a little bit more detail, I think. So that's kind of the initial setup of the car. Uh, and then for you know, the movement, um, basically, because we, we have these parameters, so uh, location, speed, direction, and so for that, we're updating the, the image that we're using. Uh, we're creating some new coordinates. We're moving the car to those coordinates. Um, and then we're also moving the map to those coordinates as well. So that's essentially how the car is functioning in, in the application, which moves us on to the next point, which is uh, to do with reactivity. And so for this app, we, we're tracking a, a lot of our important map details um, as reactives and reactive vowels. So we have our current location index as a reactive vowel. Uh, we have our first and last location. Uh, so kind of little calculation to figure out if we're at the start or the end. We have those as reactives. We have our location data and our current location data as reactives as well. And then we also have kind of some UI parts as reactives too. So like the current postcard and the current description, um, which we'll see in a little bit helps us to kind of automate the updating the, um, the UI. Uh, we try to keep the static UI as minimal as we can, as, as we've seen so far. Um, and we do that by defining these UI elements in our server. So we use these render UI and UI outputs, and then that allows us to use reactives and reactivity to update our UI. So back into the code and in the map page server, so we have our reactives up the top here. So we have our current location index and we start off from whatever this global variable happens to be, which most of the time is one. Yeah, we can change that for testing, but most of the time we start off at the start. Uh, and then we have our first location and last location reactives, which just tells us if we're at the start or the end. Our location data, which 
takes in our, our locations, which were loaded in global. And then we just do a little bit of formatting to them uh, and sorting. And then our current location data, which is filtering this reactive here to just our current location. And then the postcard and description, which is pulling the image path and the description from the location data specifically. Um, so these ones in particular are quite handy because we can, you know, that allows us to kind of, we can build our UI using those elements specifically. So if we look into say postcards and then postcards has uh, some multiple kind of nested stages. So we have postcard front and postcard back. Postcard front here, which we can just use the current postcards so that's at reactive, which we have, um, which holds the, the path to the image. Um, and so that means that whenever that reactive updates, the, the UI will update you know, on its own on account of you know, the process of reactivity. Uh, and similar thing in postcard back here, where we're using the current description. So anytime uh, our location changes, the description changes, and then the UI changes. So it all kind of happens on its own. One thing that we like to look at sometimes with that is the uh, React log. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with this, but it's kind of a, a neat tool for uh, examining the reactive chain of your application. Um, so I can quickly run that here and we can see kind of what that looks like. So if I go, so is it react log enable? And so that kind of sets it up and it's running and it's waiting. And then I just run the application. This is a local version that we'll have here. And then I'll just click through a couple of points here. And in the background, the React log is, you know, it's recording, it's watching what's happening here. It doesn't really matter what I do too much, but if I bring up, uh, so I come back into here and then I say, shiny React log show. And so that brings up a React log for this application specifically um, for that session that I just did. Uh, and so from this, we can see, yeah, we can see how the different reactives and reactive elements link together. So we can see you know, this first here, we have the current location, which feeds into uh, these reactives here. So first and last location, uh, which feeds into these observe events. Um, and it kind of goes from there. So you can kind of get an idea of what relies, what elements of your um, reactivity are relying on the other elements. If you wanted to get you know, really specific, you can click on certain elements and then you can see you know, everything that say the current location data is linked to. So you can focus in on specific parts of your application as well. And so you can then step through the different stages and you can watch how your reactive chain essentially operates as you run the app. So that's quite a, you know, quite a handy one for us as well. Um, okay. So I think it's with the reactivity and then with the, we'll just quickly look at the um, observe events that we have set up. So this is watching the start and back buttons and reset buttons, things like that. And so that's kind of just uh, handling like our, our UI elements, things like that um, for, for the back button that sets up there and then updating the car position. So we're putting together, kind of preparing these different parameters here and then we have this function update static car position, which will then uh, make a call to our JavaScript as well. So this is kind of all happening mostly in these uh, observe events here. So how we actually link up those uh, buttons and uh, you know, user inputs to the, to the car, um, which kind of ties into the last uh, few points here, which is to do with the user experience. So these are the, the little things that we do along the way to uh, improve the overall feel of the application. So things like animating the car, um, changing the direction, uh, making the map follow the car, um, turning off the map interactivity, uh, showing, hiding, disabling controls based on the state of the map, uh, even like animating the background, which we do with just kind of you know, CSS animations. Um, so for the car, so we already talked about how we animate the car. So um, comes to mind is that the you know, the simplest solution is often the best solution. And we tried 
a lot of other more complicated things like you know, inverting the image CSS transformations, all kind of things like that. And then realize, yeah, you know, why don't we just use multiple different images? So we have one image for the car facing left and one image for the car facing right. And so we just swap between those depending on what direction the car should be going. Um, Cause we don't need it to be you know, more complicated than that. And we just assign that icon to the marker, you know, as we saw in that, um, in the uh, JavaScript function here. So we just uh, change the source of the icon to whatever direction we want to go in. Um, and actually for the direction, so that's calculated um, in the observe events for, so when we go forward or back. Um, and so we're doing that based on the longitude. I think it's the longitude. Uh, so we're just checking is our current longitude greater than our new longitude and if it is then the car should be facing left and if it's not then it gets calculated in those observe events and then uh, feeds into the um, into that javascript function to update the icon uh, for the map then uh, and the map interactivity we already looked at uh, the the leaflet options so the minimum maximum zoom and disabling dragging so that you don't get lost. Um, when we make the marker, we talked about setting the interact, so disabling the interactivity for the marker. Um, so we're trying to kind of make it, uh, yeah, because the overall look and feel of the application is kind of themed around this road trip and it's these postcards. So we're kind of, it's, it's more of like a, a look, don't touch kind of thing set up there. I mean, you can still zoom in and out a bit, but there's not really anything to be gained by interacting with the car. So we just disable that to make it a bit cleaner. Um, having the map position following the car movements. Um, so we're sending it to the, so we're sending the camera, I guess you could call it, to the same position as the car. But uh, it, at least it feels like it, the camera kind of arrives a little bit faster than the car does. So that's happening in this step here. So with this move to and we give it a certain speed uh, and then the map pan to so that's being given the same speed but it feels like the camera arrives there slightly faster and that's good because you know, if, if the car arrives before the camera then you would be able to queue up more movements while the camera is still moving and then you'd end up with some kind of unexpected camera behavior which we want to avoid so easiest way to do that is to just make the camera arrive a little bit first for the controls so we disable the controls while the car is moving um, so that also allows us to prevent these unexpected movements so going off track um, you know just rushing through all of all of the movements in half of a second um, and so we do that again in that uh, in that javascript function here so in these start and end functions here so we're finding all of those links and then disabling them when this when the car starts moving uh, and then Again, when it stops moving, we're removing that disabled class from it. Um, actually, the other thing that we're doing in here, which is useful for mobile, um, which is, yeah, if, so we have a scroll locator, so just like a little invisible element uh, attached to our postcards, so that if you're on mobile and you're not looking at the postcards, when the car arrives at the location, it will scroll into view so that you can actually read the text on the postcards. Um, so that's where that's happening there. And then showing and hiding the controls based on the map state that uh, we are doing kind of in the in the server parts. So we're using remove UI and insert UI for some of it. Uh, and we're also using um, kind of uh, run JS to, to handle some of it as well. So at the first position where we hide the, uh, the back button and then at the last position where we take away that forward button and we replace it with a restart button. And so where we're actually doing that in here in the map page server. So we have uh, down here, so we have is first location. And if it is, then we are hiding the, the back button. So using uh, run JS, so basically we're adding that hide class to it so that it won't be visible. And then at the last location, we're removing the next button and we are inserting uh, a restart button instead. So that kind of allows us to customize the, the UI um, on the fly, depending on uh, what stages people are at. So that co about covers most of the aspects of the application in a bit of a lightning fashion. Um, quick summary. So we try to minimize our code in UI and server. 
we like to have kind of a modularized code structure uh, and we prefer to keep things in the server and use render UI rather than having your static UI that we can't change as easily later. Um, using the leaflet JavaScript plugins in Shiny, which allows us to kind of extend leaflet beyond the beyond what would normally be capable out of the box uh, for leaflet for R. Uh, using reactivity, having lots of different staged reactives um, makes it easier for us to uh, set up the different uh, functionality and also updating the UI and taking advantage of the different UX features to really just polish up the, you know, the overall what you what uh, what goes back to whoever's using your application. So that's about all we have for that. Um, we do, as early mentioned, this we are planning on putting this on on our GitHub. Um, we do have some other projects already available on GitHub, so epiinteractive.github.io. Uh, so we have uh, several kind of little self-contained examples of things that you can do with R and Shiny uh, available on there. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, and otherwise, I think that's about all we have. So thanks, yeah, thanks. for coming along. Thanks, Nick. And um, yeah, so we, we put up the code. So give give us a bit of time and maybe check check in in a week or a couple of weeks' time. And uh, I, I believe, Rachel, we can also share then the recording um, yeah. of the session because uh, you might want to use some of the methods we showed. Um, and I guess it's a fun little tool, but you can maybe also see it's when you think about so storytelling with data or so, so you can uh, use that probably another context where you sort of sync up certain explanation or outputs with uh, with a map um, and and show actually context as you as you move along. So um, I hope you find that useful. Um, I mean, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn or Twitter. And so we are quite active there. And so whenever we we have something available, um, you would get that in your feed. And I saw that uh, at least I saw one person from New Zealand. So we are hosting an event twenty uh, seventh of um, uh, of May here in uh, in Wellington. That's the R Exchange. So we bring a lo local community, our community together. And uh, yeah, should be should be a fun event. Uh, so I come to, for those of you who are local to come along. Otherwise, I think we have a bit of time to uh, take questions. So if you want to awesome. ask us something, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And I always feel like we need to use these clapping emojis because you can't hear us clapping when it's virtual. <laughs> but thank you so much for a great presentation. I want to um, remind everyone, if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand here on Zoom or feel free to use the, the Slido link too if you wanna ask um, anonymously, just put it back in the uh, chat. Um, there actually was an anonymous question which is what I wanted to ask you too. So <laughs> thank you for the, this question as well. Um, it was, what would you do differently when you start this project? Like if you were to start this project over again? That is a good question. Um... <laughs> Yeah, because there's there's always there's always things in hindsight that you think, oh, I would definitely change that. I think for me, the thing that comes to mind is probably um, probably a little bit more following the dry principle. So don't repeat yourself. Um, so there there were certain aspects in in this code base where we're kind of you know, replicating the same calculations over and over in different places. So if I was to do it over again, one of the things that I would definitely try and do better this time would be to, you know, more use of these like utility functions and splitting things out into, into these functions so that we can just write the logic once and then just reuse that rather than having to, um, you know, run through it and, and rewrite it multiple times. I think there could also be a case for, um, you know, creating like a, uh, going a little bit deeper into modularization. So having like a separate module for the map um, or something to that effect uh, for next time, potentially. I think there was also a question about um, JavaScript and for those of you guys who don't know about JavaScript because it's a little bit of a separate thing probably to R. 
and uh, sort of, um, and the question was, do you have any recommendation for those of us who don't know JavaScript to start learning enough to do things at, uh, at, uh, to interact with leaflet? So maybe a, a little bit what what's available out of the bo uh, box to interact with maps. I think that, as I understand the question. <laughs> So with um, with JavaScript, it, it it is definitely a little bit of a separate thing, um, but because yeah, it does tie in quite nicely to Shiny. So I think we find that as as you kind of progress with Shiny, yeah, you, know, you kind of pick up little bits of JavaScript along the way, um, just because it can be quite a handy kind of workaround to certain aspects. Um, in terms of like what's a resource for for getting that understanding. I, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. I, I'm quite fond of things like uh, like uh, Code Academy. Um, I, I know they have quite good courses on on things like that. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of it uh, for for Shiny specifically is kind of just it came up along the way, and we kind of just add that to the list of of things that we can do. You know. Thank you. Uh, let me go back over to Slido and see. There's another question that was, how long did it take to complete the entire project? It was a relatively yeah, quick turnaround on account of it being, so it's kind of our end of year um, project. Um, and so we, we would like send that out to, to people that we worked with throughout the year. So we needed to have that ready before everyone's gone on their Christmas holiday. Um, so I think, cause there was also kind of a design phase to it. Um, would I, would I be right in saying probably about a month overall, Lily? Yeah, probably. And um, yeah, so there, there was a bit of a design part up front. Mm. Um, we like to put a bit of thought um, in it beforehand before you really start coding. And um, so we, I mean, we're glad to have um, um, uh, with Shana uh, uh, UX and UI designer on board, and we like um, to use Adobe XD quite a bit. So that's a that's a design program, and you can specifically for web interfaces where we can draw out the interface. So um, that typically speeds up the development process quite a bit because it's clear where certain elements uh, sit. So you don't need to go backwards and forwards a bit. So we we. I think we had to adjust things a little bit like with the car movements or so. So we, we didn't quite know what was pos um, possible with relatively, uh, let's say, a relatively low effort because we it's a, it was a side project of us. And um, But then maybe development time, but, but maybe a week design and think about it and then um, three weeks or so to to develop it. Um, probably not full time, but uh, a bit, bit on and off. Yeah. So, um, yeah, rel relatively confined project. Mm. It's one of the other good things about these, yeah, our, our Christmas, tr uh, Christmas tool tradition. Is it kind of gives us the opportunity to experiment with things that maybe we wouldn't normally get to try. So, it's quite a fun one always when it comes around. That's awesome. I see. Okay. Will, you have a question. Yeah. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Um, I had a question for Nick on the UI where you said to keep it in the server function, and then I think you passed it to the or keep it in the server module module, pass it to the UI module via render UI. That's so that you don't have to be passing data between those modules so that it's all just in that server function. Was that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So so that we can use the reactives that we have and and um, so with with uh, the UI outputs and render UI, so that is it's like a val it's a valid reactive context. So the the main reason why we do that is so that we can use those reactives to either decide on what parts of the UI we're going to show, so we can conditionally show certain parts of the UI, or in this case where we have them kind of directly going into um, into parts of the UI. So we're pulling that text out of the um, out of the location data and putting it directly into the UI. Um, so if we were to do that in, you know, in the UI part of the application, so that's kind of static, um, we would have to be you know, updating that manually. Um, but yeah, so why we push it always to the server, or we prefer to push it to the server, is so that um, we can have access to 
and it's not just the reactives as well. We can we can do you know, we can use um, so we can do regular R functions, calculations, things like that that we can then tie into it. So it's kind of just expanding our options by doing that. Awesome, thanks. Mm. There is there are things to watch out for. Um, not so much in in this one, but generally, um, so things like if you have uh, uh, so like uh, inputs, so like drop downs or sliders or things like that. If you're creating those in your server, then you might need to do things like you know, making sure that those things have actually been created before you use them. Um, so there are there are trade offs to it, but overall, that is kind of the approach we favor. Great, thank you. I was curious, do you use some of these apps to show customers what's possible? Or I think a lot of times people like on the data science hangout will ask questions around if they're interviewing for a role and they wanna be able to show apps that they built. It's great to have toy examples available as well. So just curious if you use these with clients. Um, yeah, sometimes when, when you come, like mentioned sentence, sort of storytelling with data, sort of um, maybe show kind of how you can sync up certain elements and maybe also interact with maps. So um, we we have that suite of tools and sometimes we pull it pull, pull it out of our sleeves and then show, show at least elements of it, yeah. So they can be quite useful and um, maybe having a little bit those um, passion projects running on the side can be quite useful just to expand a little bit what, what you typically do so that you, and, and that tends to then, so we, when we explore and dive into other things, it tends to influence other things as well. So because we knew, okay, that's possible. We knew a way to do it. We use it in other projects as well. So it's uh, we found it always good to have some some passion projects running where, where you're in it or, or have an idea and then tinker with it. And that flows then into, into other things as well. Yeah, that, that's great. I was looking at it thinking it'd be really cool to see like a customer journey map as well or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I hope that sparks some ideas. So when we've got the code out there or f um, feel free to use ideas and hope it sparks kind of using it in your own project and uh, get a more map moving or to, to plot maybe some animations on a map. So I hope that sparks some ideas uh, with uh, your projects as well. But thank you so much, Uli and Nick. That was amazing. I'm excited to be able to see the code too. Awesome, welcome and uh, yeah, nice, nice to meet you all. And thanks for joining. Thanks for having us.